Oh, yeah, well, let, let's dig in. Hello, everybody. I'm David Cooks, and I tell you what. We know that paralysis can take on many forms. It can be physical like mine, or it can be psychological. And what we try to do is feature stories that go from difficult places to fulfilling purpose. What seems impossible can be done by you. At the young age of 17 years old, he was producing and presenting youth programs for Dutch public radio and television. It may knock you down. Don't let it stop you. His company is called Nether Voice, uh, which serves major clients on all the continents, offering narration in natural, neutral English and in Dutch. Whenever something really, really bad happens to you, you no doubt ask yourself the question, why me, why this, and why now? And those questions are so hard to answer because you're looking for a purpose. You're looking for a reason for something completely unreasonable to happen to you. Because I believe that a lot of bad things that happen to people are completely unreasonable. If we didn't ask for, we don't deserve, and yet they happen. And you have to give that a place, you have to give that a meaning. And a meaning for me is that something good can come out of something bad. Got so much to give, a lot of life to live, you must go from paralysis to purpose. Get your pen and paper out. Yeah. I'm taking notes. Paralysis to purpose. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Paralysis to Purpose to Podcast. I'm your host, David Cooks. Let me just stop and thank you for listening to our podcast. And more importantly, sharing this podcast, hit that like button and leave us a review. That helps us very, very much. You know, uh, I love what I get to do because I get to interview some of the most intriguing and inspiring people in the world. And today is no exception. I think you're in for a treat. Paralysis to Purpose really talks about people's journey from a difficult place to a place of fulfilling purpose. And what was that journey filled with? You know, here in Paralysis to Purpose, we focus on three things. We talk about the importance of perspective, perseverance, and partnerships in helping us along that journey. And today, let me just tell you about this guy, okay? Get his resume together. Uh, he is a multilingual voiceover coach, uh, he's an author. He's originally from the Netherlands. I think you may be able to detect that if you listen really closely. Uh, he now lives and works in the United States, just recently moved to Vermont, if I remember him telling me that, way north, not too far from Canada. He likes the outdoors and all that kind of stuff. Um, his career began at the young age of 17 years old, uh, and he was producing and presenting youth programs for Dutch public radio and television. Well, that was the beginning of a storied and unbelievable career. His company is called Nether Voice, uh, which serves major clients on all the continents, offering narration in natural, neutral English and in Dutch. He's also a coach and you know he's got a lot of stuff going on. We'll give you his website and all that at the end so you can check him out, okay? Um, he is also the, also the author of Making Money in Your PJs. Who doesn't want to do that? <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> Free, freelancing the voiceovers and other solopreneurs. So that's his book. Check it out. Making money in your PJs. I got to get that. Um, <laughs> like I said, who wouldn't want to do that? So uh, without further ado, no, there it is right there. There's the book. There's the book. <laughs> Making money in right. PJs. I'm wearing PJs even now. I, I won't show you, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, that's no, how I live. <laughs> no visuals, please. <laughs> uh, so uh, without any further delay, I'd like to welcome Paul uh, Strickward. <laughs> See, I got it all wrong. I know. I, it's I, such I, a hard I, name. It's Strickward. It right. Strickward. Strickward. So yeah. it's Paul Strickward uh, to the podcast today. And uh, Paul, just welcome. And I'm, I'm so excited to have you here. I'm excited to be on. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, we have some stuff in common. You do voiceovers as well, right? Yeah, we do a little bit here and there and trying to uh, expand my um, income streams mm -hmm. and <laughs> figure out how to make my pajamas more profitable. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you narrate your own book too? Uh, yes, I did narrate my own book. And that, uh, that was a process for me of growth um, because it was one of those things that I really wasn't comfortable with. Um, and I don't know about you, but... I still don't like to necessarily listen to myself um, <laughs> speak or, or talk. And so I did I did narrate the book as well. So, well, hey, you know what? Um, 
for for our listeners and and some of you you may be new so I won't go into all of the details of my story but that was a very significant day for me it was October 19th of 1979 when I woke up I was 15 years old it was a Friday went to school with some back pain and within 24 to 36 hours uh, I was in a wheelchair because a blood vessel erupted on my spinal cord uh, that was the beginning of a journey that uh, I continue to walk today but it really um, ties into the paralysis to purpose theme of our podcast. What do you do when life hits you really hard, unexpectedly? And it hits you in a place for me, it was two days from basketball tryouts and I was excited to try out. I had worked all summer, worked really hard, had just gotten a clean bill of health from my doctor. And then all of a sudden that's gone and it's over. What do I do? Well, March 26th, 2018 was our guest, our guest very important date for him. It was a date that changed his life. Um, and we're going to talk about that. So I know March 26, 2018, Paul, take us to that day um, and the event itself, and then we'll, we'll walk through the journey. Right. Let's set the scene for a little bit. You know, I am a full time professional voiceover and I work mostly for my home studio which is a triple walled sealed off space. It's pretty much like a prison cell, but I go there voluntarily and it has this huge heavy door that you have to really pull in to close and it's completely soundproof inside because you don't want to have any background sleep steep into the, the, the recordings that you make. You know, people don't want to listen to your audiobook and hear the neighbor's dog bark or the leaf blower. So everything needs to be almost 100% soundproof. So once you're in there, you're isolated as can be, and you can go about your business and record whatever you want to record. And it's kind of my, my sanctuary place. It's a place where I make my money, where I do my creative work, where I do a lot of writing, a lot of reading as well. So this was my, I'd say seven by seven little space that I lock myself up in every day. And I was in the middle of preparing a script for, um, for another voiceover client. And I, I, I I hadn't felt really well all day long, but I blacked out. I didn't even know when it happened because I just woke up and I was on the floor of my studio feeling the most terrible headache that I ever felt in my entire life. It was this piercing knife through my skull that was messing around in my brains. That's what it felt like. I said, what is going on here? And I tried to, I knew something was wrong, but I tried to locate my phone and I could barely see something was wrong with my eyesight as well. And I said, okay, I need to ask for help because something is going on that is really terrifying. How do I get help? Well, the best thing I could do is just call my phone, call Siri to call 911. So I tried to speak and it sounded like, like Siri, call 911, call 911, Siri. And I noticed that I could barely speak and half of my face felt paralyzed. I said, okay, I can't talk to Siri. I have this piercing headache. I have to get up and get on my seat because I was just on the floor, blacked out. And then I noticed that almost half of my body was completely paralyzed. And then it hit me. I think I've got a stroke. And uh, that's exactly what happened. Now imagine me being in that soundproof room by myself in the house. I could cry out for help and nobody could hear me because nobody could hear my voice. That's right. My wife um, was away at the time. She was a council member for a local borough and she had a council meeting and she expected me at that meeting. And I always go to my wife's meetings to be of support to her and to know what's going on in her life. So when I didn't show up, she started feeling uncomfortable because she said, Paul always says, always does what he says and says what he does. So there must be some, something wrong with him that he's not here. And she got this really bad knot in her stomach. She said, you know, I think it's something serious because my wife and I have this very close connection that when one doesn't feel well, the other doesn't really feel well. It's it's astonishing, but we, we, uh, it, it, it worked out really well and to my advantage in this case, because she, she sensed that something was seriously wrong. In that meeting of the town council, the chief of police was there and he saw that something was wrong with my wife and he said, come on over, come over, what's going on here? And she said, I think something's wrong with my husband. Could you and your team please do a welfare visit? Because I, I don't have a good feeling about this. Mm. 
And that decision saved my life because um, I, couldn't, I couldn't move, I couldn't speak, and I was gradually using the oxygen in my, in my voiceover booth up, so I was tr suffocating as well due to lack of oxygen. And I want to talk about um, the instincts of a woman. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, because, um, and it's, it's also as a testimony to the closeness of your relationship. Yeah. That there was such a bond there mm -hmm. that um, she sensed it. And I, and, I, and I stopped here just because I think sometimes we ignore those types of moments when we feel something in our gut and we're not sure what it is and we just sense something is wrong. And we'll, a lot of times we'll just ignore those things. And I think that sometimes those are signs for us to stop and, and respond to those things like your wife did. I, I think that's amazing that here you are in a soundproof room and your wife is sensing something is wrong and she tells them, please, just go do a welfare check. The fact that she would say that is so significant. Yeah. So, so she does. She so she, they come and they come and find you. What what, what happens next? <laughs> well, they had to to locate me first because they they didn't they had never been to my house, so they had to find out. And all I could do at that point was really bang on the walls of my studio. The, I couldn't raise my voice, but I had a little bit of power left with the part of my body that wasn't paralyzed. And I banged on the walls. They came down to the basement and they opened that huge, heavy studio door. And and, and, in, and when you do that, there was an intense sucking sound. That, like the, the space I was in sucked itself full with fresh air and I could finally breathe again. And um, the, the chief of police looked at me in the eye and said, Paul, are you okay? Okay. And said, oh, I think I had a stroke. So he immediately called the, um, the paramedics and uh, they called a helicopter and it was manufactured to uh, the nearest stroke center. But they came in the nick of time because that's one thing. If you ever encounter someone with a stroke, you need to be as fast as you can in taking the person to the hospital. The longer you wait, the more brain cells are going to be destroyed. So um, I want to do a little um, uh, commercial for stroke prevention or helping somebody with a stroke. Remember the words fast. If you think somebody has a stroke, look at the F for their face. Is it partially paralyzed or not? Can and and the A is for arms. So ask them to move their arms. And if part of their body cannot move one arm, then part of their body might be maybe paralyzed. And then the S is for speech, slurred speech. So face arms and S for speech. Those are some symptoms, signs of a stroke. And then the T is for timing, which is crucial. So the, the faster you can get somebody with a stroke to the hospital, the greater chance they have to survive. And apparently my wife had that hinge, that hunch, that gut feeling at the right time. And the, the, the policemen were there at the right time and they got the ambulance there at the right time. And so things came miraculously together. But you know what? On, on the way to the hospital, I almost died and um, I don't remember anything, but they, you know, it's like in a movie scene where you're hooked up to all kinds of equipment and you almost flatline. They almost thought they lost me. And um, the doctor was calling my wife from the helicopter and said, you know what, prepare yourself for two scenarios because I won't be able to talk to you once your husband comes into the operation theater. One is that he'll die and I, the chance could be like 75 to 80 percent here. But the other, the other option is that when he wakes up, he's big, not going to be the person that you knew. It's probably going to be a plant because we don't know the extent of brain damage, but based, we don't know how long he's been there in, the, in his studio locked up. But you've got to prepare yourself that you have to be this caregiver for life. You have to feed him, bathe him, take him to the bathroom, do all those things. So those are your options, basically so that you're prepared. So um, luckily I'm still here and you can see that I'm talking, I'm come walking. So things turn out differently, but it was a very, very dark day. And um, what happened was when they flew me over to the stroke center, the doctor um, did a throm uh, thrombectomy where they go to your groin area and bring in a tube that has like a little grabbing thing in the yeah, back of the yeah. tube. And they shove it all up to your brain where they locate the blood clot that was causing the stroke. And they grab the blood clot, take it out and remove the pressure from your brain. And by that time you're in the clear. And I can 
the, I was sedated for the for the procedure, but during the procedure, I woke up and I felt this thing grabbing in the back of my head, holding on to the source where all the headache came from, and I felt it grabbing and taking it out, and I had this immediate sense of relief, no more pain, and I looked into the eyes of my doctor who really saved my life, and he all he did was. You're going to be great. You're going to be good. You're going to, you're going to survive this. <laughs> he wow. spoke a little bit too early, but it was rather dramatic. I mean, I'd, I'd never been in a helicopter before and I prefer not ever have to go under these circumstances. Right. Because it's loud and it's, you, you, you don't know what's happening there. This is remarkable already. I mean, we, <laughs> I just the fact that um, a couple of things that I, I find interesting and I understand um, is the doctor, the doctors have to give you their diagnosis uh, and their diagnosis is there is that their diagnosis um, but obviously that didn't their diagnosis didn't hold and they were able to really uh, go in there and you were able to sense the relief immediately from what they had done um, you still had a recovery ahead of you um, and when, when we come back I, I want to pick up there on uh, on the recovery process but before, before we get there, um, what was it like for your wife? I'm sure you guys have talked about it. When she heard those words, you need to prepare either for death or to be a caregiver for the rest of your life. D does she ever talk to you about what that felt like or what that meant or what that did to her? Yes, she did. And, um, she had something like, you know what? That's just one opinion. <laughs> and we had had some some experience of being in a similar situation like that because we have a daughter and when my daughter was four, she had a brain tumor, which was the size of a nectarine, which is huge. And, and my daughter was always very happy-go-lucky, very active. And at one point she totally out of the blue became very lethargic. So we knew something was wrong. So we had her brain scanned and that's where they found the tumor. And we had the same talk with the doctor said, we know, prepare for the worst. And um, she said, you know, I'm going to just hope for the best instead. I don't want to hear anything negative or doomsday scenarios until we really get a sense of what's going on there. And um, I'm going to hold the most positive outcome in my mind. Because if you start thinking that things might end up in a worst case scenario, that affects what you do, what you think, how you feel. And the person that you're supposed to help is going to pick up on that and can find some sense of despondency or fear or anything. And you need to really be there and support that person and hold the best image of total recovery in your mind's eye. And that's what we did with my daughter. And that's what she did with me as well, because she, she has multiple sclerosis herself. So she knows a lot about overcoming and living with, with, a, with a disease that can paralyze you as well. And um, she has dealt with a lot of doctors who gave her the worst case scenario. But till this day, even though she has full bone multiple sclerosis, she can still walk, talk and teach. She teaches flute and piano. She can ski again, thanks to new medication. So whatever doctors tell you, <laughs> I mean, take it into consideration, of course, because they are the experts, but it doesn't mean that they're worth its truth and that, that they give you a self-fulfilling prophecy, not at all. I mean, there's so many advances in medicine that have totally changed the, the recovery process. And um, different doctors have different opinions. It's a science, but it's not an exact science. It's ultimately, if you want to be there for the person that you need to support, hold the best uh, scenario possible in your mind's eye and think that that is what's going to happen. Yeah, no, that you're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I did not know about your wife's situation, your daughter's situation. So you, man, look, the fact that, um, and I get it. I remember when I was in, in rehab and the first thing the doctors began to tell me was all these things I would never be able to do again. And I just refused to go there. I wanted to go to what can I do? What do I have? What capabilities do I have? And it is important um, because that's all about perspective. And how you see a thing determines how you attack it. And to, to you, you and your wife's credit, you said, you know what? Uh, we respect the medical profession and their opinions, um, but we're going to choose to take a positive approach to this and then see where we land with that. And I think, boy, that what a, what a, what a powerful, powerful message. 
And the thing about your wife having multiple sclerosis full blown mm -hmm. and, and doing all the things that she's doing. Yep. Wow. Yeah, we went from like 10 years ago, she loves to ski and then she was diagnosed later in life. And one of the things she couldn't do after she was diagnosed was um, ski. What she had to do was learn how to sit ski where I was behind her pushing kind of a, a sled. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really skiing to her. It was me pushing and us going down the slope. It was fun. Right. But, you know, uh, um, it, it was not skiing the way she wanted to ski, you know. But now, thanks to new medication, she's skiing again and she's walking and she can do anything any normal person can do. And just like some people uh, cannot see that I've had a stroke, if you would meet her, you wouldn't see that she has multiple, you wouldn't notice that she has multiple sclerosis. And the same story for my daughter, by the way, who's now uh, 20 years old, you wouldn't be able to tell that she ever had a huge brain tumor removed. It's, you know, and a lot of that stuff sounds maybe anecdotal and and you know oh gosh exaggerated but i live it every life you live it every life we are examples of that this type of thing can happen so if it is a possibility never rule it out and i in fact i remember my wife telling me that she had to tell the doctors that were visiting me while i was still sedated she, she heard doctors talk negatively about my recovery she said i don't want to hear any of that stuff when you're here whether or not my wife my husband is listening or not i believe that he is listening at the moment you only talk about positive things and that he will recover we'll see what the outcome is in the end but i don't want him to hear all that negative stuff because it can creep into him and he might start believing what you're telling him and i'm telling you uh, well, the outcome is not determined you know people have gone through miraculous things there is, there is miraculous healing and I just choose to believe, you're absolutely right, it is a belief mm -hmm. that he will heal from this and he will recover. And I want you to do the same thing because that's what we're paying you for. You're a doctor here to heal and make sure that he will recover. Wow. So well, yes, I got a trooper there, absolutely. Yes, without, without her, I wouldn't be here. Without my, my doctors, without the police force in Wilsonboro, Pennsylvania, I wouldn't be here. And um, yeah, we can talk about the journey of recovery as well. But the recovery yeah. starts as, as, as soon as they make your diagnosis. Right? One of the things I wrote in my book, I said one of the most um, powerful things that the creator gave mankind is the ability to believe. And that ability to believe can change everything. And it changes how you respond and how you react. You said something, and we'll end it on this before we come back, that if it, if it is possible, then... Oh, man, I, I forget how you said that. Something about if it's a possibility, then let's go down that road, you know, and let, let's do that. So if it is possible, let's do that. So we're going to take a really quick break. Um, I'm, I'm having a great conversation with Paul Strickwerda. Got it right. And uh, <laughs> we're going to be right back on Paralysis to Purpose, the podcast. And we'll pick it up here with Paul's miraculous recovery. We hope you're enjoying Paralysis to Purpose, the podcast. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Paralysis to Purpose for more updates. Also, check out David's website at davidcookspeaks.com to learn more about his mission and purchase his book, Getting Undressed, From Paralysis to Purpose. Before we get into your um, recovery, which, as you said, started immediately with a diagnosis. Um, let's talk about the foundation of your belief system, uh, you and your wife, and and because that that did shape your your perspective, not only in your situation when it came time for you to deal with adversity, but with your daughter. Uh, where did this belief in the possibility thing start for you? I think it started at a very early age. You know, I'm the son of a Dutch Protestant minister. And for a great part of uh, my dad's career, he was a chaplain in a hospital. And he was in fact the first hospital chaplain in the Netherlands. He came to the United States to study with uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was one of the first people really to study the process of dying and how you can help the dying. And there he discovered, studying with her in the USA, 
that there was something called like a hospital chaplain. We didn't have that in the Netherlands. So he said, this is such a good idea that people who are in a situation of life and death need spiritual guidance and counselors and people in the hospital who are part of the staff to help them deal with what's happening to them and help them recover. So he started the hospital chaplaincy in the Netherlands he became the, this, uh, the chairman of the association of hospital chaplains. And he told me a very interesting story. He said, Paul, I can, after so many years of being a chaplain, I can pretty much tell walking into a room and listening to somebody's beliefs, whether or not they have a good chance to survive their disease or their illness, the cancer or whatever it is. I said, how do you do that? I mean, you can't read minds. You don't have a crystal ball. He said, no, but I listen to people, how they describe their faith. And for instance, if they're Christian, and if they believe in a punishing God who says that you have to pay for your sins, so you have to endure this cancer, I punish you by giving you this disease, you have to endure it. You cannot rebel against God because God gave you this as a situation that you need to learn from and probably may not even survive. So if people had a very negative image about their disease as being a punishment of God that they had to endure, they were not going to do a lot of things to get better because it was God's will that they ended up in the hospital. It was God's will that they ended up in, a, in an accident, whatever it was that took them to the hospital. So that's one belief. The other belief is that people believe in Jesus who healed the sick, who raised the dead, and who was against disease, who, who helped people who were disadvantaged and who were sick and help them get better. If you believe that God is a God of mercy instead of a God who wants you to suffer, you're going to do everything you can in your faith to help that healing process. So based on some of his personal beliefs, he said people stand a better chance of dying or a better chance of surviving. And he says it never fails. So there's this connection between the mind and the body, between what we believe, what we tell ourselves. Because when we tell ourselves certain things, every cell of our body listens in. And you know, the thing about belief is whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. It's your feeling of certainty that something's going to happen. So the way you talk to yourself, the thoughts that you think, and the suggestion that you're giving yourself all have a big impact, not only on you emotionally, but also physically. I mean, in another life, I studied hypnotherapy. I was a licensed hypnotherapist and uh, we all hypnotherapy is based on suggestions you know i think all of us have seen some shows where a stage hypnotist gives somebody like a, a very sour lemon and gives a suggestion to the person who's being hypnotized that this is the most delicious and sweetest peach they've ever had so they taste this sour lemon and they say oh my gosh this is such a wonderful wonderful sweet fruit so what happens there is that the mind overrules the body in that case and gives, even though they're having this sour fruit, gives them the impression that they're tasting something sweet. You can do that many, with many, many things using hypnotherapy. And the suggestion is nothing else than a belief that something is true or not. So I, one of my theories, I'm not a psychologist in life, is that we are very suggestible to self-hypnosis. We, by every thought that we think, we are hypnotizing ourselves into believing a certain thing. Now, here's the liberating thing about that is that you can choose what you believe in. You can choose your thought. You can choose your suggestion that you give yourself. So if you have a choice about the glass being half empty or the glass half full, what do you choose? If you have a choice about, I can survive this, I can, I can overcome this, and it can come out of it on the other end and feeling even better and more empowered, you can choose that. Or you can choose to be defeated by whatever happens to you. So that's the, how beliefs can change your attitude and attitudes can change your behavior and your behavior can change your outcome. So with all of that baggage, well, baggage is a negative word, but that's, you know, all the resources that I've had from the past, I think those things helped me tremendously in my recovery process. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100% with what you said. Um, and, and the older I get and the more I begin to understand um, how the mind actually works and how what you feed your mind and your subconscious mind and all of that, it really does make a difference in the quality of your life and the possibilities of your life. Uh, because you, as you said so profoundly, 
whatever you speak to yourself, your entire cellular system is listening to and will respond to what you say. So let's talk about your recovery um, because that was, that, was, that was a great background, which gives a basis for how you, how you and your wife began that journey from literally paralysis to where you are now. Uh, what, what was the recovery like? I mean, was it quick, fast, and in a hurry, or were there ups and, ups and downs? What was it like for you? <laughs> It's so funny when, when you're in the hospital, people start sending you cards and everybody says, we wish you a speedy recovery. <laughs> Get back up as quickly as you can. <laughs> it's a very nice thought and I very much appreciate it. But and a speedy recovery is not necessarily a good recovery. Some things do take time. And with strokes, I always tell people, there's a reason why we say different strokes for different folks, because different strokes impact different areas of the brain. And based on the area of the brain that has been impacted, you will come out of a stroke differently. Some people will need to be um, uh, spoon fed for the rest of their lives because they're completely dependent on the care of others. And other people like me who just go about their business and are almost totally recovered, I think, Today, I'm almost 90, 95% recovered from my stroke. There's some residue there. So um, nobody knew how I would really wake up from that sedation. And that's why my wife said, you know, say positive things when you're around his bed, because that will influence the way he will wake up. Because I think his unconscious mind is listening. You may not think it's true, but that's listening. So feed the person that you're with, that you're taking care of, positive suggestions because can't hurt that's the good thing about those things that cannot hurt what can hurt is that you are all negative and think about the doomsday scenario and the worst things that can happen you people can hear that in your voice and feel that in your energy but the opposite is true too if you're optimistic you're sending those signals you're sending that energy to the person who's recovering so that that was for me to start but then when i woke up my gosh I didn't even know where I was. I didn't even know for how long I had been out. I couldn't remember what had happened, how I got into the hospital. So you're there by yourself in a room surrounded by machines that make all kinds of weird noises. And uh, I had a big tube stuck in my throat because I had to be, I couldn't really breathe by myself really well yet. So I, there's obviously some residue from that stroke because they had to... to to wait for parts of the brain to take over from the parts of the brain that were damaged. And because uh, once your brain cells lost, it never grows back. It's not like a fingernail or a hair. It doesn't grow. Brain cells don't go back. They can, the functions of certain brain cells can be taken over by other brain cells. And that's something that needs to be stimulated and happens gradually. So one of the first things that I noticed was that I had a still a hard time speaking. And in part, it had to do with the tube being down my throat there. So it, it, it touched my, um, my vocal folds. So my voice has changed since I had my stroke. But also, I had a hard time um, tra uh, transforming my thoughts into words. And I still talk, talk with a slurred speech. And what was the weirdest thing was that I really felt like I could not access my emotions. I felt like so flat, nothing really moved me, nothing really touched me. And I spoke almost like in a very robotic way. I could not, what I normally do as a voice actor is I can infuse the words with emotion to give them meaning. And I felt unable to do that. And, and at that point, I, I I got to the realization who I was, where I was, and what I did for a living. And I said, oh my goodness, here I am, somebody who depends on his voice for a living, who might very well have lost his voice, his ability to communicate, to speak. What's that going to mean for my future? How am I going to survive this? You know, I had this, for one moment I said, you know, this is the end of my career. And at the same time, I had another voice said, you know, it's not, it's not going to be the end of your career. You will find some way to communicate. You will find some way to re recover with the help of the team that surround you and you will get past this. And that's, an, that's that voice. I still don't know where it came from. Maybe from my unconscious mind, maybe from a higher power. I don't know, 
but that that was a voice that was kind of beside me and beyond me but it gave me tremendous faith again and a belief that i was going to recover and that this was not the end but the voice also said yo I can do my thing, but you got to do your thing too. So this is this is a cooperation, right? It, it's you don't get it for nothing. You got to work at it. Yeah. Wow. So um, you know, it, it, being there in a hospital bed gave me kind of the existen existential crisis, you know, because I love my work. I love what I do as a voiceover. I love the ability to communicate with other people using my voice, and it's a it's a gift that I've been given and so grateful for that I've taken years to develop. I have lots of clients all over the world who love to work with me and I love to work with them. And I didn't want to give that up. And so I, I, I had to rethink if this, what would happen if this whole recovery process would not work out. And that's when I really came to an insight that has carried me through still to this day. Because another thing that I love doing, apart from using my voice to communicate, is I use my pen or my, my keyboard in this case. I love to write. Mm -hmm. I have a blog. You can find it on my website, nethervoice.com. Nether is in Netherlands and voices in voice, one word, nethervoice.com. And it is the um, most widely read voiceover blog in the industry. And I don't say that to, to pat myself on the back. It just happened organically. I never wanted to be the most well-read voiceover blog, but it's just, it, it happened uh, to end up that way. And I'm very proud of it. And, and something told me in the hospital bed that, you know what, even, even if you lose the ability to work as a professional voiceover, you still have a way to communicate. You still have a voice. You can still write to people and use your stories that you tell to, to help people further their careers or help them with whatever it is that they struggle with in their lives. Because the blog that I write is, is about voiceovers, but it's also about living life as a freelancer, dealing with uncertainty, dealing with rejection, dealing with difficult clients, you know, running a business as a freelancer. A lot of things that creative freelancers and can benefit from, they find in my blog and I have about 40,000 subscribers, which is not a lot if you compare it to the Kardashians and all the other people who blog, but in the voiceover community, it is apparently a big deal. So I, I've developed this readership and this connection with the people that read it. And, and so that was a consolation prize for me. So if this, this voice doesn't come back, the way it used to be, you can always connect to people and use your voice as a writer. Wow. Let, so let me, let me that's perspective. You know, you, you talk yeah. about purpose and perspective and relationships. We talked about relationships, my wife coming in there and my dad and the beliefs that he instilled on me. And that's the perspective that you've, that you've got to have. If, if things don't work out the way you think they, you want them to work out, there is always another way that will, 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 will help you. And it's yeah, just, I, I remember, um, vividly the same kind of thing that you're talking about how um, I often share with people that my purpose did not become paralyzed when my legs did. Um, it was up to me now to figure out how to continue to fulfill that thing, which I believe I was put on earth to do. And the thing that you said that was so profound is that you still had the ability to communicate. You just now had to figure out how to effectively do that now. And this is before there was COVID and everybody was talking about pivoting and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's just naturally what you had to do. And you you went to you went to your skill set. And I often talk about the importance of purpose being tied to your skill set and using all the tools that are in your box. Never, you know, don't don't let don't let them get too dusty or anything. You try to use them. And that's one of the things you did. You you began to communicate and you begin to know that you, you, you could write, but it didn't stop there though. Um, no. It didn't stop with that. That gave you hope, but here you are now. Our listeners are uh, hearing you talk and speak and, and seeing you on video. Um, how did, how did you go from thinking it's almost lost? You got the, you, your voice is all screwed up and you think you're going to write um, to getting to where you are now. what? And there were some more steps along the way on this journey that could have cost you 
your life again. Uh, yep. So to yep. talk about that. Yeah. Well, the, the, the big takeaway is, I think, that you got to focus on what you can and not on what you no longer cannot do. And once you start focusing on what you still can, then there's hope, you know, and that hope will give you energy to go through with whatever exercise regimen they prescribe for you. Because I've worked with speech therapists, I worked with psychologists, I worked with cognitive behavioral therapists, I worked with physiotherapists, I had this whole team of incredible people that were all there to help me get back on my feet. And um, one of the things that happens in the hospital, I always tell people hospitals are probably the worst place to get better because all they want you to do is sit in your bed and eat and drink and take your medication and not to be a difficult patient. I was determined from day one to get out of bed and start moving, start walking. Because I, uh, for me, is uh, my emotion didn't come back. So I felt that there's a connection be mo between motion and emotion. So as soon as I started moving, I started activating the neural networks in my brain, sending messages to my body that I still wasn't, that I, that I survived that stroke and that I wasn't paralyzed anymore. So as soon as I could, I got up out of bed by myself and um, I'm looking around, do I still have them somewhere? Uh, no, I don't. But I was wearing these uh, these clog slippers. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they look like Dutch clogs. They're yellow and they have memory foam inside. And they're like slippers, you know. I, those are my slippers that I take wherever I go. And so I put on my clog slippers and started walking down the hall of the hospital. And everybody started laughing and looking at their slippers. Say, hey, my gosh, this is great. Those are the best ones you've ever seen. Why do you wear clogs? And so people started asking me questions and I had to communicate with them. I had to respond. So part of my brain so much wanted to do that and tell my story that <laughs> I was tickled to start to tell my story again. So you need to give yourself some props, really, <laughs> to get out of bed and and walk around and be around people. And, 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 and another thing that really helped me was um, the, the messages that I got from my friends and colleagues on social media. Because often people say, you know, uh, when somebody's a Facebook friend, a friend's not really a friend, it's just a contact, they don't really care about you. But as soon as people found out that I had a stroke and I was in the hospital, my gosh, they reached out to me and said, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Is there anything that we can do to help? And all these people send them so much love <laughs> I could feel it. I could. I just drank it in, and that is something invisible that science cannot explain. I think, but it's such a positive force for healing as well. The connection with other people, you know, the relationship that we build. I tell people the quality of the relationships in your life depends on the quality of your life. If you have bad relationship, you have a bad quality life. If you have good relationships with people, and that's where this whole network of, of friends came in, colleagues from all over the world who subscribed to my blog, who had been reading about it and knew I was in the hospital. They all give me this warm blanket of, of love and care that I could actually almost touch and taste. So they were there and they they got me through some dark times. Plus this whole team of therapists, you know, because I had to learn how to speak again. And you, you start with learning a few words. Words become sentences, sentences become paragraphs, paragraphs become chapters. And um, I had to learn how to breathe again. And, and gradually, as I learned to use my instrument again, they made me kind of play act and gave me scripts to read, which is great because, you know, that tapped into all my voiceover over, um, experience again and said, so, you know, they give you this script and I want you to read it as somebody who's very angry or somebody who's in love or somebody who's very agitated, all these different emotions. So I had to pretend that I had these emotions without feeling them. And, and it really appealed to my acting skills. And so I started reading the script and like, very, be very playful, be like a child and once they woke up my brain that way, my emotions came back. It was somebody like opening a door. And once I got my emotions back, I could express myself. And boy, did I have a good cry or two because it was, oh my gosh, it opened the floodgates to emotions that I never knew I had. I, I, I can still get emotional if I get choked up. Because I, I noticed that prior to my stroke, I was kind of reserved and really closed up as a person and even though I had this wonderful warm bond with my wife um, 
I was not really a very emotional person. I was very rational. Everything had to be well thought out and planned. And I wasn't very much in touch with my emotions, but boy, did my stroke change that big time. When I watch a show on TV where people are being nice to each other, <laughs> I have to get tissues because I start crying. When I listen to music, even music that I know by heart, it's as if I hear it for the first time and I get so touched. When, when I meet people that say nice things to me or are friendly or help others out in need, I just get so moved and uh, I, I tear up so quickly. The other day I was at a wedding and I was the, uh, pretty people must have looked at me weird because I was just <laughs> bawling my eyes out. And that's that's the, the great thing that my stroke gave me. You know, I sometimes I, I tend to go on and on without giving you the opportunity to ask a question. But really, this is <laughs> okay. this is my great uh, great uh, luck from my stroke. The great positive thing that came from something that is not so positive is that it opened up my emotions, and with my emotions, it opened up an entire entirely different world of being being me. I'm not the same person I am anymore. I think I'm I hope I am nicer. I'm more patient. I'm more caring. I'm more compassionate and I'm more emotional. And I love every minute of it. That to me, I, I in my mind I was just thinking that you're a better person now after you've gone through this adversity than you were before. And not because of the adversity but because of the awakening of your emotions. You said, you said, I wrote down the word emotion and you said there's a relationship between motion and emotion. And when you take the word itself, emotion, take the, the letter E off, it is motion. And so you, you were able to trigger or have triggered something that was dormant in your life. And it took this situation to bring it to life. Um, there's such a powerful message in that, and that that we continue to grow and evolve and have these awakenings and to embrace them, to embrace them. Um, you you're enjoying being able to express these emotions. You're enjoying it. It expanded you as a person. It also expanded you in terms of your work um, mm -hmm. and, and the ability for the things that you uh, you do now. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you've said a lot and, and you spent a lot of time uh, talking about collaboration and partnerships. Um, and and we're, we're, near, we're near the end of time for our, our podcast today. But be, before I get you to talk about um, what the word perspective, what the word perseverance and what the word uh, partnerships mean to you, um, you are... You are a walking miracle um, in many in many regards. Not just the re the recovery of the stroke, but the re the the resurrection of your emotional self. Um, what would you tell people who are in the midst of a very difficult situation, um, and it seems dark, and and they're working at it, and they're believing, and it's difficult. What advice would you give to them? Here's the advice I would give them. Something good can come out of something that's really, really bad. And whenever, so, whenever something really, really bad happens to you, you no doubt ask yourself the question, why me, why this, and why now? And those questions are so hard to answer because you're looking for a purpose. You're looking for a reason for something completely unreasonable to happen to you. Because I believe that a lot of bad things that happen to people are completely unreasonable. Some things are self-inflicted, but there was no reason really why I should have got that stroke. I mean, I was leading a healthy lifestyle. I mean, I was probably stupid not to have ventilation in my voice over booth, which I've changed right now. And, and, and I'm glad I did. So maybe part of that was self-inflicted, but... A lot of the bad things in life we didn't ask for, we don't deserve, and yet they happen. And you have to give that a place, you have that, to give that a meaning. And a meaning for me is that something good can come out of something bad. We talked about my daughter having the brain tumor, and uh, she had a full recovery. She is now studying psychology, and she hopes to help people who have gone through similar situations as she's gone through.
So she's going to teach people based on her experience, taking something bad that happened to her brain tumor, turning it something good, helping other people. Same thing for my wife. My wife has been coaching people with multiple sclerosis who can, can learn from her experience and learn from her attitude and her perspective in life. So even though it's when you're in, in, in dark times, it's sometimes hard to look at the light. But think in possibilities, think in options, and know that there's something good that can come out of it. Mm -hmm. And it, and it will. It really will. Yeah. I mean, through my through my experience, another thing is that I'm so glad that we can talk about this is that you know I wanted to give it some perspective in my career and some meaning in my life that whenever I have a talk about voiceovers or but whatever people want me to talk about, I always bring up my stroke. Because every time I tell people about my experience, I teach them how to recognize the signs of a stroke so they can possibly help someone else in that situation. So if that's the only thing that came out of my situation that I can talk about strokes, help people recognize the symptoms and they can save one life because of what they heard from me, it's worth it. It's totally worth it. Wow. You um, touched on a couple of key principles that I believe about purpose. And I believe purpose um, that doesn't serve other people, um, that really isn't purpose. I'm not sure what I would call that, um, but clearly giving back and serving others and taking taking this, your own experience is bigger than you and it's not meant just for you. Um, why is it that um, in your family, you, your daughter, your wife, why is giving back and serving others so important and what does that do for you? <laughs> You know, I, I feel that knowledge that's not shared is not good for anything. If, I mean, I've, I've learned in the 40 years that I've been doing voiceovers, I learned a few things. I mean, you either go out of business because you're not good at what you do, or you learn a few things along the way. And if you don't share it, then you're wasting that gift. And I always want to make sure that I, uh, that the people that I, that I teach either through my writing or through personal coaching become better at things. Than I am. I want them to exceed their wildest expectations. And if I can help them discover what's inside of them and how to bring that out, then I can change their lives or can help them change their lives. So for me, it's really this whole interaction of, of giving, giving, giving that gives me the greatest joy. Because, you know, I've had lots of success as a professional voiceover. I've, I've, I've won awards. I've as one of the first Dutch voiceovers. Nobody knew me when I came to the United States. I came to the United States in the end 1999 with two suitcases and a plastic bag in my hand, literally. And, and I never knew I would be here talking to you right now, but I've had a pretty good career. Now, my greatest joy is helping others get that too and do better than, than I do. Why? Well, I, I, it's this fire burning and you know, I, I don't want to keep it to myself. I think it's egotistical, but I think that's part that gives my life meaning, that especially after my stroke, because you, you look for your life and you find out why am I here? What's the meaning? And the biggest meaning is that you can help people who, who really need it, who can benefit from you. Otherwise, keeping it to yourself, you know, when, you, when, when you're almost on the brink of dying, you know that there's nothing that you can take with you, nothing. You only leave memories and impressions of the people whose lives you touch. That's the big thing. I mean, I have I have a very nice house. I can't take it with. I have a very nice car. It's it's gonna rust when I'm dead. I have a very nice microphone here too. Nobody's gonna nobody's gonna get it. It's it. it I can't bring it with me. And it's I know it's a cliche, but what you can leave is your legacy. And for me, that's become a change in my perspective. I'm not working to make money to pay the bills or to pay taxes. I work to give meaning in my life, which is helping others to find their meaning, lead a meaningful life. Yeah. And and so I, I see myself more as a, as a teacher now and a writer than as a voiceover, someone who can influence other people's lives and inspire other people's life in a positive way. And hopefully, because words can change minds. I think we often underestimate the power of words. We say, oh, you know, um, what's this thing about sticks and stones can hurt you, but um, words don't hurt you. What's that, what's you know, that saying? Sticks and stones may break my bones, 
but words will never hurt me. That's well, the I totally, I totally disagree because I, I, I ask people who've been bullied how hurtful words can be. I, I know people who are in their sixties and seventies and they still suffer from being bullied as a kid. So I believe that, that words can be bombs to the soul and they can also be knives. So how you use those words, how you talk to each other, how you talk to yourself has such a great impact. Yeah. And, and the, it gave me, my stroke gave me a different perspective on what I do as a voiceover and what I do as writers, as a writer and as a coach as well. The, through the words that we use, we create something inside the minds of others. And I remember one story from, from Eli Wiesel, who's a Jewish author who survived the, the concentration camps. And he said, one of the great powers of the Jewish tradition is their tradition of storytelling. And there's one story about a rabbi who was such a powerful storyteller that one day rabbi came to a house and there was a man who was wheelchair bound for, for a long, long time. And people said he would never get out of the wheelchair. But the rabbi got so fired up and talked and, and had this great story that he told him about healing power of the body and the mind that this man in the wheelchair started to become so excited and he forgot that he was paralyzed and where everybody could observe and he stood up from his wheelchair inspired by those words and started walking. Now, I don't know if this is a true story, but I knew that the story, I know that the stories that we tell can have a great effect on the people that we meet every single day. And uh, I, I also know that part of my stroke is that I, that I often lose my train of thought because I live very much in the moment. There's another thing talking about a good thing coming from a bad thing. I live very much in the moment, which means I can enjoy it much more because for prior to my stroke, I always lived about thinking about the past and it's usually thinking about the bad things that happened to me in the past and, and thinking about things that I could not change anymore. But also part of me was thinking about the future. What's going to be next? What's next? What's next? It's like I went out to dinner and as I was eating the entree, I was thinking about dessert. And when you think about dessert, you don't even enjoy your entree anymore. Now I live in the moment. I eat whatever I eat and I don't think about dessert. I just enjoy what I'm, I'm, I'm eating. And that's how I live life as well. I live life in the moment. And I don't worry about tomorrow. I don't worry about the past because tomorrow that hasn't happened yet. The past I can't change. I cannot change the past. I can only think about what it's like to live today. And one moment at the, start, at the time, one step at a time, one podcast at a time. It has completely changed my perspective. Wow. Well, those that's another, you know, I don't even know what I'm trying to say right now because I wanted to talk about perspective, per, perseverance and partnerships, but I think you did. Um, you talked about how your perspective has changed and and how you focus on living in the now and, and giving for others. And, and clearly you understand perseverance because of how hard you've had to work to get back to the place that you are and to sustain that. And then earlier in the podcast, you talked about all the teams that helped you, cognitive people, physical therapists, occupational therapy, speech therapy, your wife, friends, um, all of those things were important on getting you from yeah. your place of paralysis to purpose. And so, um, man, you have, um, you have left us with a lot. There's uh, one more message to them that I'm just getting and that I, I want to want to tell to whoever is watching when you're in a, in a bad situation, ask for help, dare to ask, cause it's so hard for proud people who have lost certain abilities to ask for help. I was one of those proud people once, but I'm so glad I did ask for help. My, my, my father-in-law who lives with us now, he's 91 and he's not doing so well, but he's a proud man and he doesn't want anybody to help him. He wants to do things himself and he can no longer do it himself. So for him to ask for help was a big, big deal. And it really impedes his progress that he can still make. Because he, he refuses to go to a physical therapist because he was raised to do things by himself on his own. He is his own man. Well, I had to accept that at some point I was helpless. I wasn't hopeless, but I was helpless. I had to hang on to the people in my environment and ask for help. And when you ask, when you knock on the door, the door will open and you will be given a tremendous opportunity. Because as someone who receives care, you also give somebody the opportunity to give care to you, which might fulfill their life's purpose. So yeah. don't be afraid to ask for help. In fact, embrace it, relish it, cherish it, 
because it will do wonders for you. Ask for help. Don't be afraid. You're not alone. You don't have to do it by yourself. There are people around you, more people than you ever think were around you. I mean, not that I didn't have to work at it myself, but you have a, if you have a team around you, it's so much easier. You need to have cheerleaders. Every team, every no team, how, how good a team is, every team needs a coach. They need cheerleaders. You need to have people on your side who say, you know, we've got your back. Even in the darkest moments when you think you're falling back and the recovery isn't going so well, it's, it's, it's not all fun and games. You have to face the dark parts too and, and the, the, the obstacles, but you will get there with the people that, you, that, that love you. And all the things, the perseverance, you know, and the perspective and the relationships, it all comes down to love. Love yourself and love that you get from other people because love will give you different perspective. Love will, will feed all your relationships and love will help you persevere when things are not going so well. And the strange thing about life is that we often learn more from the things that don't go well than from the things that do go well because we already know how to do those things. So use adversity as a teacher and let it lift you up and let others lift you up. And you come out on the other side, a new person. New, new and improved, hopefully. New, new and improved. Well, Paul, I'll tell you what. Um, you've been a fantastic guest. Um, this last thing you were telling our, our audience um, is one of the things that I learned also about receiving help and allowing people to get a blessing for serving me and helping me. And I, I learned at, at, at a, as a, the, old, the older I got, um, and when you're in a wheelchair, independence is the one thing that you want and you want to have it and, and do that. But I began to understand that um, I'm a help made man and not a self made man. And I've had help along this journey from a lot of people. And I refuse for the rest of my life to shortchange people from sowing seeds into my life through helping me because I was cutting off their blessing. And I've learned that as well. So well said, Paul, thank you for being our guest today. Uh, I'm excited um, to now be in relationship with you. I can tell we're going to have some conversations and some things to talk together about and perhaps do some collaborations on some some uh, things where we can serve other people. Um, if people want to follow you uh, what and on social media, what is the best way for them to do that? Well, I'm known as the Nether Voice, the voice of the Netherlands. See if you go to your browser and type in Nether Voice, you'll, you'll get all the platforms I'm active at. I write a short inspirational story on Instagram. So it's at Nether Voice on Instagram, short story every day. I write a, a longer blog every week. So you go to nethervoice.com, my website. You'll find me at Nether Voice on Facebook, on Twitter. I mean, <laughs> you cannot um, uh, escape me. I, <laughs> he is, so he is all voice. over. The, he's all over the place. Yeah, yeah, you got to be. You know, it's yes. If you if you have a message that you think is important, sharing, you got to increase your platform and use all the different media at your disposal. But it's such a great way to connect people. That I mean, there's people that follow my blog and on Instagram that have nothing to do with voiceovers. They're doctors, they're athletes, um, they're people who dance at an opera th a theater in, in, in Italy. And I'm, in, I'm, they connect with me, they write back. Once you start opening up to this whole whirlwind of, of that is social media, it adds another dimension of, of relationships in your life that you never thought possible. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, um, I've been challenged today um in some areas of my life to expand what i do and why i do it and um for our listeners make sure you go back and listen to this podcast a few times stop it pause it because there are things that were said in this podcast that are truly life-changing and that will help you to change your lives so until next time on paralysis to purpose the podcast i'm your host david cooks reminding you that your ability to endure is always greater than your willingness to endure. You can do anything you put your mind to.
Thanks for tuning in to Paralysis to Purpose. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Paralysis to Purpose on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. To purchase his book, visit davidcooksspeaks.com. Be sure to tune in next time for more inspiring conversations with David Cooks. I knew that in order for it to be a real sustainable change, I had to transition because there was a lot of learning I had to do, you know. I had to understand, you know, that not everything that's vegan is necessarily healthy, you know, and that's part of the education process. When you start to think about it, it becomes very simple. So no meat, no dairy, right? Mm -hmm. Oreos aren't meat and they don't have any dairy in them. Next time on Paralysis to Purpose. <laughs> he goes by DJ, DJ Hines. So you can eat a pack of Oreos and you're, <laughs> you're eating vegan. <laughs> you know, um, another example and i don't want to throw too many brands out there but potato chips mm -hmm. you know um potato chips are potatoes oil and salt you know so you can eat a big bag of potato chips and it's it's vegan so it was understanding the vegan diet that was healthy for me paralysis to purpose